One of the most important things you can do before starting a medical school, or starting any degree for that matter, is getting a good studying technique down. Now, plenty of students can get through high school, get the grades, and then get into medical school without really ever having to think about their own learning. However, when you get into medical school, you no longer have teachers spoon feeding your information. The responsibility to study lies solely with you. And then in medical school, you've got the additional challenge of sometimes feeling like you're trying to drink from a fire hydrant with all the information that you need to learn. So in this video, I'm gonna go through five different studying techniques that you can use in medical school or in any degree for that matter that are evidence-based. And I'll link the studies that I've used in this video down below in the description. Hi, my name's Colin and I'm a junior doctor working in the UK. In this video, I'm going to talk about retrieval practice, spaced repetition, interleaf practice, the Pomodoro technique, and metacognition. So let's start with retrieval practice. This is basically a form of revision which involves essentially recalling information without having the information in front of you. You might have also heard it being called active recall. The idea is that it's harder for you to recall the information when you don't have it in front of you and it's that difficulty that helps you learn. And the alternative to that is, if you don't know an answer, what you would typically do is you'd flick through a textbook or you'd go rewatch a lecture or you might even Google the answer. And that's the easy option, it's the passive option, and that doesn't help you learn. And another way of putting it is, you're essentially taking information out of your brain rather than putting information into your brain. And it's that process that actually helps you learn. Now, there's lots of different ways you can use active recall. So for example, if you've been to a lecture and you come back and you want to write up your notes, rather than re-watching the lecture again or going straight to your textbook, try writing everything down that you do remember from the lecture. In the book Powerful Teaching, this is referred to as a memory dump. It's essentially you're getting all the information out of your head onto the paper. And this process of taking it from your head and putting it on the paper, like I said, is more challenging. But studies have shown that this does help you learn this information. And it has shown that you're more likely to be able to recall this information at a later date. Probably more importantly, studies have shown that even if you're getting the answer wrong and then you're correcting yourself, you're more likely to be successful in remembering the information in future attempts. So basically the first time you might get it wrong, but then the second, the third and fourth time that you come across this information, you're unlikely to get it wrong. And that's the ideal situation because that's what you want for your exams. Now let's go back to the lecture example. You've had a lecture at the beginning of the semester and you've not really come across that information again now that you're coming up towards your exam. But you do want to start recalling that information because you've you figured out that it's an effective way for you to learn. So how can you go about that? Well, there's loads of different ways you can go about recalling information. You can take quizzes, you could do past paper questions, you can do multiple choice questions, or you could just do what we've termed a memory dump again. Essentially write down everything you know about one specific subject and then go look at the information you have, whether that's a lecture or a textbook, and fill in those gaps. But like I said, there's plenty of different ways for you to be able to recall information as part of your studying process. As I've said before, you're essentially trying to pull information out of your head onto the paper in front of you, which is exactly like it will be in an exam setting, rather than trying to memorize information and put information into your head. And this is one of the reasons why highlighting notes or rereading textbooks or re-watching lectures is so ineffective, because you're just trying to put information into your head, and it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to remember it all and recall it at a later date. So now moving on to spaced repetition. Now this idea came from a German psychologist in the late 1800s by the name of Hermann Ebenhaus. And basically what he did was he decided he was going to learn a list of random objects. And he went through it and went through it and went through it until he memorized them. And then he just left it. And he left it and timed how long it took him for him to forget all that information. And then he went back and relearned the list in full again. And then he did the exact same thing. He timed it to see how long it took him to forget all the information again. Now what he found was the second time he learned information, he was able to learn it quicker and it also took him longer to forget that information. So what he did was he did it again for a third time. And this time he relearned the list and timed how long it took him to forget that information again. And this time it took him even longer to forget the information and he was able to learn it even quicker the third time around. And you can repeat this and repeat this and repeat this. Now essentially what this is showing is when you learn information for the first time, you're likely to forget it and you're likely to forget it pretty quickly. But if you come across that information again, well, you'll forget it a little less quick and you'll be a little bit quicker when you come to learning it. And if you keep repeating this process, eventually it'll be a really slow process in forgetting the information. If you do forget any of it, it'll be really quick just picking that information back up again and you will retain it. And this theory has been applied to a graph and this graph is known as the forgetting curve. And you can see it here. Initially, you forget the information really quickly but then the second time round, you forget it a little less quick and it takes you a little bit less time to actually learn the information and so on and so on and so on. So how does this all fit into medical school and studying? Well, the whole idea is you're essentially trying to overcome the forgetting curve. So in order for us to retain facts in medical school, we have to come across the information again. We have to space out our learning. We may come across information at the beginning of a semester, but then we need to re-expose ourselves to this information 
midway through the semester and then again as you head towards the end of the semester so that you don't forget the information. So you might try and learn the fact that cranial nerve 4, the trochlear nerve, innervates the superior oblique muscle. And you've learned that at the beginning of the semester. But then you might forget that after a couple of days. So then you go back and you go back over it again and you remember the superior oblique muscle is innervated by cranial nerve 4, the trochlear nerve. And you might remember that information for a little bit longer, so you remember it for a week this time, but then you forget it again. So you go back through it again and you go trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4, innervates superior oblique muscle. And this time you remember it for a week and a bit or two weeks and so on and so on and so on. If you keep re-exposing yourself to the information, you're less likely to forget it over a period of time. So that when the exam eventually rolls around, you've got that down. And if you apply that more broadly, so say you've went and learned all 12 cranial nerves and you've got that information down, you know all 12 of them, you know all their innovations, you're happy with it. If you don't go back over that information before the exam, well, you're likely to have forgotten it. You might find yourself in a situation going, what does cranial nerve four do again? What cranial nerve is a trigeminal nerve? Now, to overcome this issue, you can go back over the methods I discussed previously. You can start doing things like quizzes or past papers or taking part in multiple choice questions. And through doing this, you might come across the cranial nerves five or six times before your exam. So when you start studying towards when you've got your exams, you'll just keep repeating the same thing over again, over a period of time. And it's through this that you'll overcome the forgetting curve and be able to retain the information for the long term, which obviously is gonna help you get through your exam. So now let's move on to interleaved practice. And I've done a whole video on this and I'll link it up here, which talks about interleaving and blocking in a lot more detail. In this video, I'll do a bit of an overview. So when it comes to studying, you might decide you're going to study neurology. And what you could do is you could take your ne neurology part of your textbook and go through all of that. You just keep doing neurology after neurology after neurology. And that might take you three days, for example. And that's what's known as blocked practice. However, a more effective technique for studying is called interleaving. And that's when you say, I'm going to do neurology in the morning. Then I'm going to mix it up and I'm going to do respiratory in the afternoon. And then I'm going to do psychiatry in the evening. And then I'm going to do respiratory the following morning. And then I'm going to do cardiology in the afternoon. And then I'm going to go back and do neurology in the evening. You're mixing up your subjects, you're mixing up your topics, and through doing that, it's actually been shown to be a more effective way of retaining information over the long term. And mixing up your specialties when you're revising actually has an additional benefit. It basically forces you to link connections between the different specialties. That's good in the context of medicine, because if a patient presents with chest pain, well, that could be caused by a respiratory condition, or it could be caused by a cardiac condition. That can help you distinguish what the patient's coming in with. There's also evidence to suggest that not only does interleaving help you memorise a topic, memorise facts, it can also help you with your problem solving ability. Now this aligns with a study by Samani and Pan 2021 and they basically utilised homework topics for an undergraduate physics class and they basically gave these homework assignments and they split the group of students into two and one group got questions which were in a sort of blocked practice so they were all under one topic and then they did them one week and then they swapped them to the next topic the following week and then they, the following week they did the third topic whereas the other group got them all mixed up and they just did mixed up questions for three weeks and they actually found that when it came to the random quizzes that they were being given that the group that had the interleaved homework assignments were actually doing better on the quizzes. They were actually able to understand the problems better and were getting higher scores on their tests. However, one drawback to interleaving is students find it really difficult. It's actually really challenging flitting between one topic to the next, to the next, to the next, and that can put people off. So if you're finding something challenging, especially when you're studying for long hours, you, the last thing you want to do is make it more difficult for yourself. So a lot of students then go back to the blocked practice because they find it easier, find that they're actually getting on top of a topic and understanding it, so they want to keep doing that topic. Whereas within it or leaving, you might just be getting on top of a topic and then you're forced to move on to something different and you're back at square one again. But like I said before, it's that difficulty and that challenging situation that you're putting yourself in that actually helps you remember the information more and also helps you to distinguish between different topics. So despite its challenges, it's actually really useful and students should stick with it. So now moving on to the Pomodoro technique. The Pomodoro technique is a way to maintain focus and fight procrastination. So the idea is you can break down any task into much smaller components and that'll help you focus. The typical time skill used for the Pomodoro technique is 25 minutes to five minutes. And the 25 minutes is basically an intense period of focusing on your work. And then you're rewarded with a five minute break. This technique was developed in the 1980s by a university student called Francesco Cirillo. I might not got the pronunciation of that right, but anyway, moving on. What he did was he was struggling to study for his exams, like lots of students, and he couldn't maintain focus. And he told himself, right, I'm gonna sit here for 10 minutes, and I'm gonna get 10 minutes of work done. Break it down into smaller components, so that'll help. And what he did was he took one of those tomato kitchen timers, and Pomodoro is basically the Italian word for tomato, and he placed it on his desk, twisted it to 10 minutes, and got through the work. Now eventually he drew this out a bit more. So what he would do is he would set the timer for 25 minutes, do his work, and then, like I said before, reward himself with a five minute break. And that was considered one Pomodoro, 30 minutes. Then he would do it again. 
Another 25 minutes of work, five minutes of rest. Two Pomodors. And then you keep going, so you get three, you get four, and then you get five. And after four or five, you can give yourself a bit of a longer break. So rather than giving yourself a five minute break at the end of the fourth one, you might give yourself a 30 minute break. So you can go get something to eat and you can wander around and just get up from your chair essentially. Well, why does this technique work? Well, according to this book, it limits the amount of time the brain has to focus. It demolishes the tendency to procrastinate. It reduces distraction born of multitasking and it pushes the individual towards completing tasks rather than just working on them. And as I said before, the typical timing for this is 25 minutes of work and five minutes of rest, but you can mix it up a little. If you're finding it easier for you to yourself to do 50 minutes of revision and then take a 10 minute break, well go for it. Or maybe the opposite of that, you're finding 25 minutes is too long, so maybe you want to do it in a bit of a shorter burst. You can even reduce it down to like 20 minutes, for example, and then give yourself a two minute break. You can mix it up a bit. The sort of classical use Pomodoro technique is 25 minutes of work and five minutes of rest. Finally, let's move on to metacognition. You've probably been in this situation before, I know I have, where you felt like you've gone through a whole day of studying and then you get to the end of the day and you think about what you've learned and you can't think of anything. Or another scenario is you've spent weeks and weeks and weeks revising for an exam, you get into the exam hall and you feel like you know nothing. You sit there with the paper open and you feel like you can't answer any of the questions. And then you get to your results back at the end of the exam and you get a poor result. And you're like, why did I spend so much time studying only to get this result? Or why did I spend so much time studying and not get a good result? And this is where metacognition kicks in. Metacognition in its simplest term is thinking about how you think and how you learn. And to quote the University of North Carolina, the key to metacognition is asking yourself self-reflective questions, which are powerful because they allow us to take inventory of where we currently are, how we learn and where we want to be. Now this is important because students will often overestimate their capabilities and think that they know something when in reality is they don't. Students are often overconfident about how much information they know. So what metacognition techniques are available to help you overcome this? Well, number one, the first thing you can do is look at any previous exams tests you've done where you thought you'd studied well but then didn't quite get the grade you were expecting. This can lead you to picking up on topics that you don't know very well and it can also get you to start questioning your own study habits. The second point is you can also start to reflect during a study schedule. So after a week of studying, you can start to think about is this studying working well? Am I retaining the information? Am I getting through enough work? Am I already feeling burnt out? If you reflect on how it's going after one week, you have plenty of time to make changes. Metacognition also encompasses practice questions because essentially practice questions are forcing you to recall information and check if you're getting the right answers. Through this, you can reflect on what you do know and what you need to do more work on. Hopefully you found this video helpful. I've done a few other study related videos in the past and I'll link these up here. If you have found this video useful, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks.